after the first military coup that installed Major General Johnson Thomas Aguiranzi as Nigeria's first military head of state on January 16, 1966. The Northern soldiers had started planning by May 1966 the revenge of their leaders who had been murdered in January. The Northerners were the major casualties of that coup that was carried out by soldiers mainly from the East. To them, it was an Eastern-favoured coup as Aguiranzi's regime was believed to be extremely partisan. This highlighted the feeling of insecurity of other groups. It created more problems than it solved old ones, which led to severe criticism of the supreme leader. The general himself may not have been necessarily nepotistic, rather, he failed to see the sectional and clannish implications of events, policies, and appointments that were made during his tenure of office. 194 days after taking office, Agui Ironsi was murdered in a northern counter coup on July 29, 1966, and for three days, the nation had no leader until Lieutenant Colonel Yakubugu I succeeded the late head of state on August 1, 1966. Governor Lieutenant Colonel Chukwemeka Odumegu Uchuku refused to leave the region for any meeting anywhere in Nigeria. In a rejoinder, the federal government too argued that the Nigerian leader Yakubu Gowan could also not go to the east for a meeting. His life, they also claimed, was not safe there either. Tension mounted and Lieutenant General Joseph Arthur Ankara of Ghana offered a neutral meeting place. The venue was Aburi, Ghana. The Aburi meeting started on January 4, 1967 and lasted for two days. Those who attended the meeting included Head of State Lieutenant Colonel Yakubu Gawan and military governors of the four regions, Hassan Usman Katsina of the Northern Region, Robert Adeinka Adebayo, David Akbode Ejo, and Chukwemeka Ojuku of the West, Midwest, and Eastern Region, respectively. Others included the military administrator of Lagos, Mobilaji Jansen, and the head of the Nigerian Army, Commodore Joseph Idet Akinwale Wei, and the Inspector General of Police, Al Haji Kam Salem, among others. Aburi was significant for several reasons. First, that the leaders met at all was an achievement in itself. But even more tangible was the fact that the leaders agreed that force would not be used to settle the brothers Malava. There was also the question of the disposition of Nigerian troops and the reorganization of the army after the second coup on July 29, 1966, and the subsequent killings that followed in May and September. Further, Ojuku said that his region was perturbed, that contrary to Gowan's promise on August 9, 1966, that all soldiers would return to their region of origin, northern troops still occupied the western region. Gowan replied that his promise on August 9 applied to the repatriation of soldiers of northern origin stationed in the east back to the north and those of eastern origin stationed in the north back to the east. He had fulfilled his promise, he said. He then emphasized that soldiers of northern origin would remain in the west since there were only a few Yoruba in the Nigerian army. Ojuku was not satisfied and further insisted on a reorganization of the army on a regional basis. Gowan was also firmly opposed to splitting up the army Ojuku claimed that Nigeria did not have a central government since the country, as a result of the second coup and its aftermath, resolved itself into three separate sovereign areas, the Lagos West-North area, the Midwest area, and the East area. But Gowan insisted that Nigeria was still one nation, an entity composed of four regions and a central government in Lagos. Ojuku then proposed that the situation in the nation necessitated a drawing apart of the regions because the separation of forces, the separation of the population, is in all sincerity 
necessary in order to avoid further friction and further killings. The other leaders who also wanted one Nigeria agreed to Ojuku's proposal, but apparently without understanding the implication. This was the bombshell of Aburi. Lagos had anticipated the move and had prepared for it. On May 27, 1967, Gowan declared a state of emergency for the entire nation and announced that he had assumed full powers for the short period necessary to carry out the measures which are now urgently required. Decree No. 8, which was promulgated deliberately to appease the East, was nullified. Gowan also announced that Nigeria was divided into more states, 12 in all. Nigerians were jubilant as the minorities felt secure and out of domination by the majority peoples within the former regions. The northern region was broken into six states, Northwestern, North Central, Northeastern, Benue Plateau, Kanu and Kwara, thereby cracking its monolithic posture. The east was broken into three, the Igbo people having their own state East Central and the non evil minority people in the east two of their own states Rivers and Cross River. The Midwest remained as it was. Some part of the western region was carved out and merged with the Federal Territory of Lagos to form Lagos State. What remained of the western region became the western states. The creation of more states in the country pushed the east central state, the Igbo heartland, into an interior pocket cut off from the coastal oil reserves and its two seaports of Portakot and Calabar. Thus, the lack of seaport for the East Central State was not unique. For the secessionists, the creation of more states was a bombshell, a political reality which they refused to accept or even believe. They began to speed up the withdrawal of the Eastern region, which would include, according to them, the two new states of Rivers and Cross River. On May 30, 1967, Ojuku proclaimed that, quote, the territory and region known as Eastern Nigeria, together with her continental shelves and territorial water, shall henceforth be an independent sovereign state of the name and title, the Republic of Biafra. The new flag was hoisted in public buildings in the east, and the police and army appeared in different uniforms. A national anthem which sounded like Sibelu's Finlandia, and which Dr. Unandi Azikiwe later claimed was plagiarized from his poem, Ode to Onicha was broadcast. While nothing particularly dramatic happened for the next 30 days, the atmosphere was tense. Though the federal government had her own share of the blames, especially its tardiness after Aburi, on July 6, 1967, the federal government mounted what she initially termed a police action to arrest the succession. Subsequent events soon showed that it was not a mere police action. It was much more serious than that particularly with the rebel capture of the Midwest region with another Igbo-engineered plot in the small Bene garrison on August 9, 1967. The assault on the Midwest had been a miscalculation, which led to the Midwest boomerang when the federal military government mounted a counter-offensive with Lieutenant Colonel Murtala Mohammed at the forefront. The succession was now such that it could not be stopped by just a police action, and the result was a 30-month cruel civil war in which over 1 million innocent civilian lives were lost, equipment worth billions of dollars wasted, and thousands of stalwart soldiers on both sides dead. With the second highest death toll of all African conflicts, the Nigerian Civil War, also known as the Biafran War, is perhaps the single most significant event in Nigerian history. This three-year conflict which raged on from the 6th of July 1967 till the 15th of January 1970, would claim the lives of over 100,000 soldiers and an estimated 2 million civilians as the Nigerian government led by General Yakubu Gowon fought to prevent the secession of the self-proclaimed Republic of Biafra, which was led by General Chukwemeka Odumego Ojuku. To fully understand the root cause of this brutal conflict, we need to go all the way back to the very beginning. Upon gaining independence from Great Britain in 1960, the newly formed Nigerian Republic was greatly divided as its three largest ethnic groups struggled to live in harmony. Beyond the more obvious distinctions like language, clothing, and marriage customs, Nigeria's three main ethnic groups also had fundamental differences in values and worldviews 
which had been developed over the many centuries leading up to the colonial era and the formation of the Nigerian state. The Igbos, who represented about 60 to 70 percent of the population of the southeast, were mostly Christians who in the centuries before the colonial era had lived in relatively egalitarian societies. Although most Igbo towns and villages were headed by monarchs known as Izes, the political decision-making process within Igbo communities was actually quite democratic as it involved general assemblies composed of title holders and other respected members of Igbo society. Status was acquired through one's ability to solve societal issues and respect was given primarily to those who had acquired wealth as opposed to those who had simply inherited it. The character of Okonkwo in the book Things Fall Apart by renowned Nigerian author Chinua Achebe was in many ways the perfect illustration of the uniquely Igbo vision of the self-made man. The Igbo's particular appreciation for wealth creation through hard work is undoubtedly the main reason why many of Nigeria's champions of industry have been of Igbo ancestry. By contrast, the majority Muslim Hausa Fulani, which represented about 65% of the northern population, had lived for many years in feudal societies in which large working class populations were ruled by a small theocratic elite composed of emirs and sultans. As their political leaders often doubled as religious leaders, compliance and submission to the will of the political establishment was not simply a civic duty but a religious one. Very much unlike in Igbo societies, there was nothing particularly odd or shameful about a man aspiring to live a modest life as a farm worker, craftsman, or a nomadic cattle herder. But contrary to commonly held prejudices, the House of Fulani were not in any way lazier or inherently less enterprising than their southern counterparts. They simply had a deeper appreciation for religious discipline and had a more socially conservative worldview. However, there is no denying the fact that while the unquestioning submissiveness of northern societies to the theocratic establishment guaranteed internal stability and order, it also meant that the North was a lot less economically vibrant. Northerners were generally less open to new ideas and often completely rejected secular education in favor of Islamic education. Demonstrating the extent of Nigeria's North-South divide, some studies estimated that as of Nigeria's independence in 1960, Northern Nigeria had an English literacy rate of just 2%, compared to the Southeast, which had an English literacy rate of 19.2%. The Yorubas, which formed about 75% of Nigeria's southwestern population, were in many ways a sort of halfway house between the Igbos and the Hausa Fulani, both in terms of their religious affiliation and their political history. Although also majority Christian, they nevertheless had significant populations of Muslims as well as followers of the ancient Yoruba religions. In simple terms, the traditional Yoruba political structure was basically less autocratic than the Hausa Fulani, but not as democratic as the Igbo. For centuries, Yoruba societies were ruled by kings known as Obas, who governed in close consultation with chiefs, priests, and priestesses. Culturally, the Yorubas were quite similar to the Igbo in their appreciation for individual drive and ambition. However, the Yorubas tended to channel their energies towards excellence in the arts and academia, as opposed to pure industry and wealth creation. Many often point to the Yoruba's deep appreciation of the arts as the reason why many of Nigeria's most prominent cultural icons such as Afrobeat legend Fela Kuti and the Nobel Prize laureate Professor Wale Shoyenka have been of Yoruba ancestry. But to say that the differences between Nigeria's three main tribes meant that every Igbo, Yoruba or Hausa Fulani person hated anyone who wasn't from their tribe would be very far from the truth. In reality, most Yoruba societies got on well enough with Igbo societies. The main culture clash, if you like, was between the Hausa Fulanis of the North and the two major ethnic groups of the South. Prior to the colonial era, ancient Yoruba kingdoms such as the Oyo Empire had for many years suffered under several waves of jihadi attacks by the Islamic Sokoto Caliphate of the North led by the famous Sultan Uthman Danfodio. Now, although the Igbos did not have a similar history of warring with the Hausa Fulani, the British colonial enterprise would create the perfect environment for the sharp differences between these two tribes to be brought to the forefront. In 1914, British High Commissioner Frederick Lugard effectively created the country we know today as Nigeria by bringing the northern and southern regions together in the now infamous Nigerian amalgamation of 1914. Till this very day, the feeling amongst many Yoruba and Igbo historians is that one of the main purposes of this amalgamation was to place the more affluent South under the control of the autocratic North. The theory goes that by joining the more educated and therefore less controllable Southern region to the much larger Northern region, 
the British government was better able to implement its policy of indirect rule, as the amalgamation essentially gave dominion over the entire country to the northern elites, who were significantly less rebellious and generally more amenable to British interests. It is also worth noting that from 1914 onwards, the British adopted a practice of placing northerners in key leadership positions within the colonial administration. Despite being generally better educated, Southerners were more often than not limited to managerial and executive roles within the colonial apparatus. When the struggle for Nigeria's independence began to take shape, it was many Yoruba and Igbo intellectuals such as the political activist Fumi Ransom Kuti and the renowned jurist Jaja Wachuku that led the fight for Nigeria's sovereignty. According to some historians, many of the northern elites were not at all welcoming to the idea of an independent Nigeria as they feared that independence would mean losing the privileged positions that they had enjoyed under the colonial structure. The story goes that as a condition for them agreeing to support the push for Nigeria's independence, the northern leadership specifically demanded that the new nation maintain its colonial political structure. And even though it pretty much guaranteed a continuation of the north's dominance, the Igbo and Yoruba leaders, in their desperation to gain independence at all costs, agreed to the north's demands. In other words, the only group that still has a vested interest in the continuity of the Nigerian Union are the Northern Elites. And in all honesty, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand why this view is so prevalent. There is no doubt that a breakup of Nigeria would most likely lead to economic ruin for a lot of rich and powerful Northerners who could potentially find themselves left behind in a landlocked country with no access to the sea, no oil revenue, and a large undereducated population of which an estimated 50% of women have no formal education. When Frederick Lugard created Nigeria back in 1914, it was arguable that he had no idea how badly the Nigerian project would turn out. But what has become very clear over a century later is that Nigeria in its current state just does not work. For a country as large and as diverse as Nigeria, the concentration of power in the Nigerian federal government is a recipe for disaster with large sections of its population continuing to express feelings of marginalization and disconnection from the federal government, many have been putting forward the very sensible case for a restructuring of the country in a way that devolves power from the federal government to the various regions. This would mean giving each region power over their own resources and a greater ability to decide their own destinies. But while the idea of devolving powers from the federal government may be good for Nigeria as a whole, it would obviously mean a loss of power for those who benefit under the current system. For obvious reasons, these vested interests are the biggest stumbling blocks preventing any sensible conversation about the state of the nation. For the sake of the many innocent and peace-loving Nigerians, one can only hope and pray that the Nigerian establishment chooses to loosen its tight grip on power before it's too late. Transport and the tank traps that Biafran's dug across the roads have reduced many of them to almost impassable mud holes. One official estimate has put the cost of their repair at 12 million pounds. Not only the roads are in a disastrous condition. This vital railway bridge across the river Emo, which links the north and east of Nigeria with the sea, is now being repaired by British contractors. The local labour here is Ibo, because the bridge is in the east central state. But only a few miles south in the New River state, it's very different. Here at Nigeria's only oil refinery, not one of the Igbos who worked here before the war has been allowed back. Some who bravely applied for their old jobs only narrowly escaped with their lives. Igbo workers have been rejected by the River State's government on security grounds, even though as a federal undertaking the refinery should recruit its staff from all over Nigeria. So the refinery is now working again without the Igbos. It's already up to its pre-war output of 30 to 40,000 barrels a day enough to supply Nigeria's present needs. But other factories at Port Harcourt remain idle. The Igbos who used to dominate commerce and industry here have not been allowed back. And the River State men, however eager to take over their jobs, have not yet acquired the necessary skills. Outside the docks, I asked some Rivers men what they thought of the Igbos. It was, though we are all one Nigeria, but they misbehave themselves. And uh, we feel at the moment, at this time, they should remain in their east central state. You don't think there is a place for them to work down here now? At the moment, we, I don't think so. Do you think it will come in the future? That Fisher can tell. But not now? Not now.
the federal government has many times said that Igbos will live with their compatriots again in peace and prosperity. But whatever General Goan may say about reconciliation in faraway Lagos, it's not happening here in the river state. This is Igrita, where these Igbos have lived for centuries. During the war, they fled, and local people from other tribes who remained seized the chance to occupy or destroy their homes and seize their farmland. So now these people, there may be as many as 10,000 of them, huddle in squalid refugee camps like this, outcasts in their own towns. All their petitions to the governor of the river state have gone unanswered. There's no indication that they will ever get their homes back. How long is it that you and your people have lived here? We have been here more than 400 years ago. As long as that? Over 400 years ago. Do you have any other home at all? We haven't got any place, no home again than here, than Ikwere here. What do you think the local people want to do to you? Well, the people say they want to fight us. So because um, we ran away when there was a booming of guns during the Civil War, you see, and the army people protect them, not allow them to fight us. So you, the army at the moment is keeping you and them apart? Yeah, the army people are guiding us here. What would happen if the army left you alone? They said they will fought, uh, fight against us. They'll try and drive you out? Yes, sir. One group of Igbo refugees in the River State has flourished since the end of the war. These fat and happy children are the same ones that we saw suffering. Future people, like you see, we have just gone through the Biafra War and see how painful it is on the war. We see how Igbos lost so many things. We see how other tribes kept quiet when Igbos are being, uh, you know, being killed by the Nigerian military. Other people will take joy in Igbos pain. We see after the war, they took things that belong to Igbos. They took all Igbos property. Every tribe outside Igbo benefited from the properties of Igbos. Yet, none of them speak and say what happens to Igbo is not good. They all take praise saying Igbo has gotten killed. We see the rule of Obasanjo. We saw that this war has nothing that we have never seen. We see that after the war, there's no tribe that stick up for Igbos. Everyone is against Igbos. But I want to say something. If you are an Igbo, be very happy. Thank God for yourself. Because we bounce back greatly and we are doing well. The quest for Biafra should continue. Because Biafra is a dream that every Igbo have to look on to. My father fought in Biafra war and I know the pains they've gone through. My father told me a lot about Biafra war. He saw his friend get killed. He saw his close pals get killed. He saw people killed in front of him. He was lucky to, you know, survive. That luckiness he has to survive, it will be a great thing for us one day to raise up and see the rising sun. The call for Nandi Kanu to support Biafra should all be taken serious by Igbos. Wherever he fell, wherever we think that he's not doing the writing, we should all join hand and make sure that the writing is being done there. He's not a perfection, he's not a perfect God. He can do some mistakes, but me and you should not stand there to watch, only to judge him on his mistakes. We should stand to help, put help in hand wherever you know you can help. If you're academia, if you're a professor, if you're a doctor, wherever you are, these people, they need you. If you know any area that you can support in this way, you support. Our governors should wake up and bring this to the parliament. I understand that this cannot continue to be this way. Those in authority should do things, should do something. Those in authority should do something. They should bring this case to parliament. The parliament or the Nigerian Senate, the Nigerian House member, they should debate on this and give people a chance to vote what they want. Either they want to still stay as a Nigeria or they want the Biafra. If they want the Biafra, the Biafra people should go. We shouldn't make this thing to be do or die. Without the Igbos, other part of Nigeria should leave. Without them, Igbos should leave too. I hope that the, the world Biafra would not want to see something like that again. We have saw the starving of Igbo children, about two point something millions of Igbo children. We saw our mom getting raped by Nigerian soldiers that came after the, after the ceasefire. 
we saw that Igbo properties had been confiscated. Igbo properties were taken over by other tribes. We saw that Igbo millionaires that owe money we are giving 20 pounds in place of their millions of thousands of pounds they have in the bank. We saw the shares of Nigerian company were sold to the Yorubas, the Aousas, and other tribes. But at the end of the day, Igbos rise up. And today, Igbos owns a lot of property, owns most things in Nigeria than any other tribe you can think of. It's not something that we are proud of, but it's something that we have to be grateful to God to. And I don't want this kind of thing to happen. I want people to stop taking you know, advantage of others. I want everybody to be as they're supposed to be. Everybody to be given equal rights. Everybody to live in a, a free country, a country of liberty, a country that you can speak, even the nonsense thing, even those things that people don't need to hear, even the things that hurt people, because it's a freedom of speech. We can't stop people from speaking. We want a country that everybody will feel accepted. A country that a poor man's daughter or son may come to the, tomorrow to be a president, or a country that the president of the country will always remain a kind of cycle. The rich get richer, the poor get poorer. We want a country that the poor get richer and the rich may get poorer or the rich may get middle. We want a country that is balanced, a place that everybody has opportunity. Not a place before you have to apply for a job, you have to seek if you are Christian or Muslim. You have to say if you are Igbo or Yoruba. We want a place that accommodates everybody. And that's a place that we want for you guys. We want you guys to enjoy. We want you guys to live in a conducive environment. Environment that will accept everybody. The war Biafra is something that we fear for everybody. I always pray that the soul of those heroes of Biafra war to rest in peace. We pray that all the injured ones that have not yet died, that are still suffering, that there will come a day that the Biafra flag will arise and we will remember all the veterinaries and give them their loyalty. Just like we have American veterinaries, we have Australians too. They have all this incentive. They have through their medicals, they have through their payment. So we have to create things like this for them. Those people that fought Biafra war, they deserve it. People like my dad, you know, they also deserve things to get something. After, at, at the end of the war, they have to be compensated. They have that. So we want such a thing to happen.